today will focus on the future of hydrogen in the next 10 years. Not a day goes by when we're not either discussing hydrogen or have not been asked by one of our clients for expertise in analysing one of a number of global opportunities from Australia to Europe to the US. We know for certain that a low carbon future is contingent on the expansion of a number of key decarbonisation enablers across four key energy vectors, power, transport, buildings and end users, backed by the rise of sustainable finance. We also know that global renewables are going to be the bedrock of a low carbon future. But a low carbon future will also require decarbonizing industries and industries are at the front line of the energy transition, oil and gas, heavy industry, technology, data centers, manufacturing, steel, all of those and many more will require solutions now to support decarbonization. Many have committed to net zero ambitions and that will require strategic and operational changes and robust carbon reporting. And in turn, hydrogen and CCUS are going to be critical in my view to reaching net zero particularly with a focus on those hard to decarbonize, decarbonize sectors. But key barriers re remain. So the focus should be on key use cases in hydrogen and attractive conditions for the production of hydrogen and CCU accelerated by government support. In our view, therefore, the focus needs to be on the next 10 years and commercially viable and scalable applications for hydrogen in that period, not in the next 40. I have with me today Kate Richard, who is Beringa's Hydrogen Capability Centre Lead. Kate has nearly 20 years of experience in the energy industry. She worked for BP in new energy technology for 13 years, for three years with Centrica in their distributed energy segment, and most recently with the Emirates Water and Electricity Company, where she led commercial and strategy functions. So she has an amazing both energy technology and global market experience uh, and is now helping our clients lead the way in the hydrogen business models and hydrogen value cases. Kate will be exploring our hydrogen hypothesis for the next decade promising use cases for hydrogen and priority regions and countries. Before I hand you over to Kate, I'd like to thank you again for joining today. I encourage you to make this a really interactive session by posting questions in the chat. And by all means, please raise your hand virtually using the functionality in Microsoft Teams if you'd like to ask a question at any time. I'll monitor both those channels and draw you into the discussion during the webinar. Please don't hesitate in joining in. The more interactive this webinar is, the better. <laughs> Kate, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to hand over to you to talk us through your thoughts on how the hydrogen market and opportunities will shape up over the next 10 years. Um, thank you, Milesh. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's nice to, to, to have you online. Um, what I will do is I'm going to start by talking a little about some of our hypotheses, and, and these hypotheses are our market transition beliefs, which are, are less about the next 10 years, but more sort of fundamental for the sort of transition to net carbon and, and hydrogen's role in that. So I, I'll just walk through these and, and, and then I'll be um, pause at the end for, for any um, questions or comments. So you know, firstly, hydrogen is a critical energy vector in the zero transition. You know, Hydrogen is not new, and in fact, at BP, we were looking at hydrogen trials well over 10 years ago, but I think things have shifted a lot, as Ilesh was, was alluding to. And um, and I think hydrogen is going to be one of the solutions that the industry needs. I mean, what what I would like to say, and, and, I, and, I, and I continue to say this, and is, is that you know, we, we should be trying to electrify as, as much as possible and, and we and, and at the same time decarbonizing our grid you know that should always be our priority uh, it's it's the most efficient way to to move towards net zero but there are always going to be hard to abate sectors like industry and some parts of transport where electrification electrification can only take you so far and so we need other solutions other molecules and, and hydrogen is one of them I don't know where hydrogen is going to be in 2050 in terms of the, the size of the market, but I'm very confident that it will be part of our energy system. And um, what percentage of electrification versus hydrogen, again, is, is, is a really fascinating um, question, but in a lot of the material that, that I, I, I read about, we, we could see as much as sort of 60% 60, 60 of electrification and, and then 40% of hydrogen other molecules. So that's a really interesting balance. Uh, so moving on then it's hydrogen is, is 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 an energy carrier okay it's 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 not an energy source uh, it's a carrier just as electricity and, and heat are and um whilst it's got some less 
desirable characteristics. It's got a low liquefaction temperature and a low volumetric density. It's got some fantastic uh, features uh, and, and in some respects it's the uh, the Rolls Royce of of zero carbon energy carriers when you when you look at green uh, green hydrogen you know it doesn't produce co2 when you burn it so it's a clean fuel by by weight it's got an extremely high energy density uh, great rocket fuel uh, and you can store it for for long periods for weeks and and, and, and months and and at the same time you can transport it for long distance so it's it's got some fabulous um, characteristics, but because of that, it, it you know, being being Rolls Royce, it, it's it's expensive. So so we need to we need to use it sparingly, as it were. Uh, the the next point I think is is going to be critical in 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 hydrogen is is the reduction in the cost of electrolysis. Um, we've seen huge reduction in the cost of renewables. We are anticipating a a significant cost in in um, reduction in in electrolysis. Um, but um, and and that's critical because green hydrogen is is not competitive today with grey grey hydrogen, and to a certain extent blue hydrogen. Um, but um, but we need to um, we, we 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 need to move this further. We need to move the dial further. You know, one of the things that I'll touch upon at the end is the fact that we're only building 20, 30 megawatt electrolyzers today. We've only got one gigafactory opened earlier this year. So to get to, to the um, technical maturity and scale that we need, there, there, there's quite a lot that we need to, to do. I mean, we need to move from processes that actually are quite manual in, in terms of building these, these electrolyzers. Um, we need to automate, we need to go from batch to continuous processing, and all of those things will help to move the, the, the cost of electrolyzers down quite, quite significantly. Uh, so, so moving on, blue and green economics, um, there's there's no there's no winner. I think there are opportunities for both blue and green, and a lot of that will be based on the availability of renewable fuels and the the quality of those renewable fuels, the availability of of, of gas for blue hydrogen, the um, the infra infrastructure that you might have available in terms of the pipelines to move that hydrogen around, and and the proximity to to ports for for imports and exports local demand, big large industrial clusters. Um, so, so these are all the things that are going to determine whether blue and green are going to be the, the, the dominant uh, source of hydrogen in, in, in areas. And one of the interesting things that we've been looking at in Beringa is, uh, is, is and it doesn't even have a colour yet, is um, hydrogen that's produced from biomass. And uh, this is a potential source of negative emissions, which makes for a very interesting um, molecule. And, and certainly our work in um, modeling, climate change modeling, um, and this has been corroborated by some of the stuff that the CCCS, CCC has done, shows that the hydrogen from, from biomass actually has quite a significant potential role in, 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 in that zero carbon transition. But um, I'd be interested in knowing what uh, what people have as views for, for the colour scheme of that, because at the moment I, I think it's a bit of a blank blank canvas there. Um, so, so moving on, there's potential for large scale transport of H2, um, driven by kind of resource poor economies like Japan and Korea, um, and rich producers uh, from a renewables perspective like Australia and Chile. Um, so there's some clear transport routes in the what I would say the medium term, um, but there's no reason why we won't have a, you know, a, a hydrogen market analogous to LNG by by the 2040s. So, so that's something that's going to be really interesting to watch the progress of. Uh, this is all going to be this decade is all going to be about policy. Uh, as I've mentioned, these 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 sources of hydrogen cannot compete with the incumbent with blue hydrogen. So we need we need the political support to develop this. It's also a, a, a an industry that needs infrastructure. Uh, so, so you need to roll out the infrastructure at the same time as developing the demand centers and, and building out the supply. And, and to make all of that mesh together and work needs needs support. Um, so, so we're going to see a lot of uh, projects that are built off subsidies in the short term. But hopefully as we move forward, we'll be shifting to a, a, a model where carbon prices is, can make some of these um, sources of hydrogen competitive with with the incumbent. 
And then the final comment I'd just like to make on here is it's, you know, it's, it's not just about energy, and, and I'm certainly seeing that in the UK. Uh, hydrogen and the technology around hydrogen has, has huge opportunities in terms of job creation and techno technology manufacturing and, and leadership in that space. Uh, it's worth noting that um, Boris Johnson announced a, a bus strategy a couple of weeks ago and talked about the delivery of 4,000 4, British-built electrical hydrogen buses. So, so there's some, some opportunity for uh, tech technology leadership in this space as well. That's really helpful, Kate. Just before you move on, I think I think it's really important to emphasise that the, the central hypothesis from a Beringa perspective, I think, is whilst a hydrogen rainbow, and I think it is genuinely a rainbow with many colours, and there's already some questions on on what colours you categorise biomass on in the chat, um, but it's definitely a rainbow. I, I think is obscuring a central hypothesis here, which is in a world of cheap renewables and in markets with cheap renewables, as long as electrolyzer costs fall, a green first hydrogen strategy is likely to be more cost effective over the next 10 years. Uh, and, and the exceptions to that will be markets where gas is really cheap and where adaptation to hydrogen plus, um, sorry, we're, we're, and an adaptation to green hydrogen is possible through pipeline infrastructure. In the absence of that, green hydrogen we think is a winner and should be a winner in the next 10 years, given markets with potentially very, very low cost renewables. And Kate, I know you're going to talk about particularly the, the Middle East, for example, where access to low cost renewables is, is, is leading to some really interesting opportunities. It's also true of Australia. And the final build, I think, Kate, that you emphasise there, which I think is spot on, is the, is the role of carbon pricing and taxation in drawing switching between potential different fuels and technologies uh, for customers in particular. Is there a question so far, Kate? So I think we can move on. Yeah, OK. So I think... Um... If you're not aware, so hydrogen is, is not a, a, a new molecule and there is a huge amount of hydrogen already in our energy system today. And uh, in, in 2019, there were 71 million tonnes of, of, of hydrogen. And, and one of the things that I, I, I struggle a little bit with is, is, is the units or, or the different units that get used to try and describe Sort of the size of the hydrogen market. So, what I what I did on the, on the right hand side, as you see here, is I just did a little a, sort of back of a back of an envelope calculation to just to give give people a sense of what that means if all of that hydrogen was was green hydrogen. Now, currently, it's it's grey and it's mainly used in refining and industry. And, and in the industry, particularly, you've got areas like steel and ammonia and I will come on to that um, and that's predominantly grey produced through a process called steam methane reforming uh, and, and, and natural gas being the main um, feedstock into that although in China they they, they use coal um, as, a, as an alternative but but in 2020 at a, at, as an estimate we've got 73 million tonnes a year which equates to around 8,300 tonnes of production per hour. Now, if you wanted to dis to substitute all of that with green hydrogen, you would um, you would build your electrolyzers and you would probably uh, get an efficiency of around 70%, but you would need to, 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 um, to couple that with significant renewables. And if you assume that you might get 40% capacity factor out of your renewables, that equates to 1,000 gigawatts of, of renewables. Uh, we're also looking to, we are expecting hydrogen demand to grow in the next 10 years. And a lot of that growth is not because of decarbonisation ambitions, it's because of growth in industry. And, and so the IEA have projected an increase in hydrogen of 50 million tonnes a year and if you do my um, my back of an envelope calculation, that is an additional 200 gigawatts of, of capacity. And just to put that into context, the global renewables capacity in the whole world reached around 200 gigawatts last year. So, so what we're saying is, is, is the hydrogen demand just in the next 10 years is going to be equal to 
all of the renewables that we've we've built up until this point in time. So it's a it's a huge huge market today, and it's going to get even bigger. So what I'd like to do now is just talk a little bit about what we see going on around the world. Uh, Nearly half of de de developed economies have uh, hydrogen plans, are preparing plans, have strategies, have light papers, hydrogen papers. So I think there's a lot of uh, excitement and, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, you know, uh, posturing in this space. Um, what, what we're also seeing is, is some key countries are already positioning themselves as uh, net exporters and conversely as as net importers i, I think japan and and, and korea were, were one of the first countries to realize the importance of hydrogen in their own en energy ecosystems and so they have been co cooperating with countries like australia to understand what the hydrogen value chain opportunities are between these two countries uh, at the same time, you've had uh, countries like Chile and, and even Sa uh, Spain and, and Portugal um, position themselves as, as net exporters of hydrogen, green hydrogen, due to the, um, sort of the high renewables potentials in this place. Over in Canada, we, we, we have Canada uh, positioning itself as a, as a hydrogen exporter, but you're likely to see a lot more blue hydrogen in, in, in Canada because of the Kind of the, the the rich hydrocarbons base that that they have, uh, so 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 that's sort of the, the import export um, maps and routes that we might see in terms of hydrogen targets. So the the, the EU, EU has been very bold. So they have a, a a a target of forty gigawatts of hydrogen by twenty thirty. So so that would be a sort of twenty percent of the the growth in hydrogen over the next uh, 10 years. Um, and, and you've got um, some, some substantial EU funds sitting behind that. Um, you're likely to see some blue hydrogen in the UK and in Northern Europe um, because of the oil and gas heritage, um, but also I think of the industrial clusters and, and some of the, um, the, sort of the infrastructure that, that's already there and the, um, the, the density of, of, of that. Uh, in, in China, uh, we, we're probably going to see, I mean, China today is, is, is actually the biggest producer of hydrogen, grey hydrogen, and, and the biggest user as well. Um, but, but they're also looking at hydrogen as, a, as in, in transport, uh, as a means to reduce the uh, particle emissions in, on their roads. So I think there's a lot of activity there around uh, transport cars and, and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, Australia, we, we're doing a lot of work uh, Aust Australian team around hydrogen and, and we're working uh, on a project with the German government to look at export of hydrogen, green hydrogen from Australia to, um, to, to, to Germany. So, so that's, that's really interesting. And, and, and the one area I think I'd just like to, to, to touch on is, is, is the Middle East, which I, um, despite uh, not being on this, on this, on this map, I think has is, is got huge huge potential and uh and, and and there's a couple of reasons why why i believe that so i some of you may have seen an announcement last year about uh, a, a five billion green hydrogen uh, to ammonia project in saudi arabia so this is part of the the, the neon vision um so that's that's 1.2 million tons per annum so it's a it's a it's a huge um it's it's, it's a huge plant uh, so, so they're looking at ammonia not just for their own um, sort of petrochems uh, industry, which they they're looking to build out, but as a as an export opportunity. You've also got so there's that that's green in Saudi. I think you've got blue in Saudi because you've got uh, obviously a lot of oil and future gas developments, and and there's there's some consideration about whether the gas fields that they want to develop and 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 for petrochems and for lng you know, actually for, for lng does it not make more sense to start looking at uh hydrogen exports rather than natural gas exports so, so for me that's 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 a very interesting 
shift potentially. And then in my uh, my my previous residence in, in Abu Dhabi, uh, when I when I left last year, hydrogen was being touted as a um, as a means to uh, to to deploy the excess uh, renewable generation that we're likely to see in Abu Dhabi. So. Abu Dhabi has got a fantastic um, track record, um, which that they are only going to to, to build on to, to to roll out significant renewables across the the Emirates, and uh, because it's 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 the lowest cost, uh, and and so they're anticipating quite a lot quite a lot of uh, curtailment as a, as a result of that, and and so it's a it's a potential opportunity for for their curtailed uh, PV and um, to, to to make that to make hydrogen with that. Uh, and then you've got the national oil company Adnoc, who have made some announcements recently around blue hydrogen, where they um, they've got a lot of future gas developments. And again, looking for for a home for that gas and, and hydrogen is, is very high on that agenda. So I think I think we're going to see a lot, uh, a lot of activity around hydrogen in the Middle East. Um, the, the the one big challenge is is of course is is, is how that um, ha how we transport that that hydrogen and, and we did a a little poll on 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 LinkedIn earlier in the week um, just to to gauge what uh, what people's views were on whether we are going to see hydrogen transported as a as, as a liquid uh, or as ammonia or as even as a um, sort of an organic carrier and. Uh, the the majority of people believed that ammonia is going to be the the um, the carrier of choice for hydrogen. So um, we'll have to see how that plays out. Thanks, Kate. Uh, just a quick question for me: are, are there any other countries that you think, based on the work that we're doing currently, could be interesting either from an import or an export perspective that we have that you haven't covered here that you haven't highlighted? I was thinking particularly of India. Do you think India is a big hydrogen market or are they going a different route? Uh, so I think with India, I don't think they're, um, I think it's a, it's a, a watching brief. Uh, I, I think there's some you know, cha challenges around air quality uh, and, and transport. And, and so I th the, the hydrogen in terms of end use cases in, in transport, but um, but but compared to other countries, I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to be a competition for low cost hydrogen. And and so um, they I, I don't envisage India being a, certainly a net exporter. Um, but whether there's a there's an import opportunity there, I, I don't know. My, my, my next question, um, I'm just checking is uh, very happy for all questions from the audience at this stage as well, before we turn to the next part of the presentation. But. We had our seminar on a webinar on renewables in Spain uh, two weeks ago with Pavlos Rikakis uh, and Alexis Stavropoulos talking about the potential for uh, really low cost renewables in Spain with merchant converting into hydrogen for ammonia. Is that the way you see the hydrogen export? I think you've marked it here in Spain working. Is it exporting ammonia largely? Uh, I think I think there's an opportunity in in in, in Europe to 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 use existing and new pipeline infrastructure. Uh, I mean, there 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 is and 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 so many of these um, use cases and opportunities, were, you know, are, are based on how integrated the energy system is going to be, uh, because uh, hydrogen is 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 a, as a is a fuel carrier, so it's a is something that can be shipped. It can some. It can be by 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 road, by rail, by pipeline. But it's also a fuel, and and I think it 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 will also depend on how some of the end use cases evolve. So you might see some ports becoming uh, import destinations for ammonia, and and so ammonia might be moved around on short journeys um, around Europe. But but I think there's 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 plans to develop a a sort of hydrogen infrastructure that that would hopefully bring hydrogen um, as a gas from from Spain up into Northern Europe. Yeah, I know there's a lot of interest in um, hydrogen trading and hydrogen trading following LNG trading routes as well, which um, we may not get a chance to touch on today, but uh, take, take, a, take a couple of seconds. Yeah. Particularly around customers and what their prepare, what their demands are and, and how that will create the market for hydrogen. But is there any questions from the um, 
from webinar attendees on on the market so far that that case highlighted give it a couple of seconds otherwise we will move on please feel free to take yourself off mute and, and ask a question if there is one i think we've got one question hey from uh uh is that haron i think yeah, hi Alesh and hi Kate. Um, quick question on, on carbon taxes. I don't know if, the, if you intend to cover that a bit later on, uh, but the role of that in, in, in stimulating the sort of green uh, versus uh, blue wedge and how that how you see that developing over the next 10 years. Any thoughts on that would be appreciated. Yeah, fine. that's a great question actually. And on behalf of Kate, Kate I think you're about to cover it. So should we do, I think we can move on definitely on that one. That's a, that's a really great question and the role of carbon pricing in uh, determining the economics for customers. Thank you, cheers. OK, um, still a lot, lots to cover, so I'll, I'll try I'll try and be uh, as, as brief as I can with, with these these value chains that, that we think are going to be really interesting in, in the short term. I mean, you, you could you could talk for an hour on, on each of these, if not more, because there, there's so much richness to these um, and, and so much sort of overlap and 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 commonality between between some of these. It makes for you know, very interesting conversation. So I'll, I'll, I'll just try and highlight what these use cases are and um, what we what we're seeing on on the ground. So uh, turning to to ammonia, ammonia is a, a, a feedstock that uh, is used in developing making fertilizers for for the fertilizer industry and most of the hydrogen that gets used today and it's quite significant is uh, gray hydrogen so they have um, these smrs that, that that feed into an ammonia plant so so the ammonia production is is actually an, an interim step because from the ammonia production you then get the, um, the 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 other chemicals like ammonium nitrate which then go into fertilizer and and, it, and to a lesser a few to explosives but mainly mainly fertilizers um, and and this is an area that we're likely to see growth as well, just in terms of the demand for fertilizers worldwide. So there's a, an opportunity, I think, for um, substitute you know, for seven seven million tons of hydrogen growth to be you know, green or blue hydrogen versus the the, the, the incumbent grey. So I think it's 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 a big you know it's it's a it's a big prize. And one of the things that I also like about ammonia is that it it's it's one of the use cases where the the end product the contribution in terms of cost to the end products is relatively small and absorbable by by the end user by the the the, the customer so as an example um, ammonia gets used in fertilizers which grow wheat which make bread um, the cost of the ammonia in the bread is probably about 1% of the cost of your loaf of bread. But yet the contribution to the CO the CO2 footprint of that ammonia going into your bread is around 40%. So by um, paying a premium for low carbon bread, you can actually enable that sort of green or, or, or blue hydrogen value chain to flourish. Um, I can talk a little bit about steel because it's a similar principle, but it, 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 it's less reliant on subsidy and carbon taxes if you can uh, educate and, and persuade and, and incentivize the, the consumer to, to buy green. And I think that's really quite important in terms of the development of, of some of these use cases. And I did my, um, my back of the envelope and uh, it's it's not insignificant the the demand for hydrogen at a um, an ammonia plant, and and if you wanted to sort of substitute out an entire uh, ammonia plant with green or blue hydrogen, then you'd need quite a lot of renewables. You'd need best part of two gigawatts. Um, now we're probably not going to see all of that being green hydrogen. That there are some projects. Be because um, because most of that comes from SMR with uh, natural gas. So there is an infrastructure that already exists there. But to to substitute that that grey hydrogen with with blue hydrogen is is a very uh, is, a, is a relatively straightforward um, decarbonisation solution. Uh, and there are some uh, examples of that going on 
going on today. So um, Yara, which is a, a major fertilizer producer, and Orsted, well, they're actually looking at, uh, at green hydrogen, um, trying to substitute 10% of the capacity of their plant. And this is and this is what we're going to see as well. We're going to see um, substitution as a, a, as a as a as a proportion of the overall demand. You know, the volumes are so significant that you can't transition these plants uh, overnight. You and you need to take kind of baby steps to to build up the 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 supply to be able to meet these sizable demands. So I think what we're seeing, and this is true for ammonia, for refining, for for steel, we're seeing 100 megawatts, uh, you know, here, 100 megawatts there, green, blue, and, and slowly transitioning this gray hydrogen into a low carbon alternative. Uh, it's, it's, you know, these, these are big, big plants, big requirements and, and Unless you're building a new plant from scratch, uh, you're going to have to you have to take this approach. So the, the the next one down is is refining. So refining uses hydrogen in a couple of areas. They use it for hydro cracking. So you take your big long hydrogen chains and you chop them up into something smaller. Uh, Desulfurization. So you're removing the sulfur content from 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 fuels to to, to be able to. Um, do something that's suitable for road transport and, and isn't um, producing lots of, of socks. Um, so, so these are the kind of the sources of, of, of hydrogen. And, and like um, uh, like like ammonia, they tend to be quite well integrated systems. So refineries will buy um, buy either produce hydrogen themselves on site or, or buy it from an industrial gas producer. So again, they have grey hydrogen from from the SMR process and um, and, and, and have it supplied uh, by pipeline or, or, or even sort of on, on site, but owned and operated by third party. And that's quite a quite a common model. Uh, and these are companies like Liquid and, and uh, Lindy who, who, who operate in, in, in this space. Uh, and, and again, um, they're big. So what we're seeing in terms of projects on the ground, we're seeing uh, more baby steps. So we might see um, BP and 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 Orsted doing a, a project to to substitute hydrogen with green hydrogen at one of the refineries. But you know that's that's a, a 50 megawatt electrolyzer, which is 20% of their overall hydrogen consumption. So it's 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 taking it's taking one step at a time. I think for the transition in in, in these areas. Uh, Moving on to, to heat, uh, heat is a uh, it can be it can be a kind of a, a controversial one for, for hydrogen. You know, it, it is a, a dominant source of energy in, in, in households and particularly in places like the UK, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Australia, the US, uh, and and so there's quite a, a mature infrastructure there and. Electrification is, is hard, and, and some of my colleagues in Beringa who work um, a lot in decarbonisation of heat will, will attest to this. You know, it think substitution of, of uh, gas boilers with uh, technology like air source heat pumps might sort of work on paper, but but it's it's actually quite challenging on the ground. And I think it's a certainly in the UK, it's an it's an easy um, it's it's an easy solution uh, from a technical perspective to substitute the gas infrastructure with with hydrogen um, that there are sort of significant costs associated with that um, if you were going to you know in, in, in but scale wise it's uh, you know it's, it's a different ball game so you can you could you could put hydrogen boilers into 100 houses and uh, and, and you would need a a, a little 0.5 megawatt electrolyzer to be able to supply or the equivalent of to supply those houses you know so in in, in terms of, of scale um it's you know it, the whole of britain is, is a big task but but there are opportunities to take uh, smaller steps and and of course with hydrogen there's a there's an opportunity to to blend um into the existing system to so blend it with gas at small concentrations and, and just get that um get that value chain started getting that moving Okay, just in the interest of time, I think this is a, a really helpful bit of analysis of the different kind of seven H2 value chains that we think are really interesting. Just at the headline level, the three that you think are most interesting and that the 
webinar and Teddy should be really focusing on for the next yep. 10 years? Yeah. So I. Uh, what would you bet on? My, my, my bet is on ammonia. Yep. And, and and steel in, in, in particular, the, uh, the green steel premium. So I think they're, they're really exciting for me. The, the one that I really want to see get off the ground is marine because it's 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 hard it's 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 really hard it has so many uh players and uh you know technology immaturity but but it's going to be a a critical um area to decarbonize and, and one of the just to just to highlight one one fact here or, or is you know un, unlike road transport these these um these ships are huge and and so their fuel requirements are, are pretty big and if you were just going to to take a ferry and, and start uh, moving that ferry with with hydrogen would um, would need a 20, 20 megawatt electrolyzer uh, just for one wow. one ferry alone. Uh, wow. So so you know you, you need to you need to line up the supply and, and the demand and be really smart about that. Wow, that's amazing. So ammonia, steel, and transport are your three bets. Um, and I know you're about to show us some some economics to back that up for at least one of those segments. So I, th I think that'll be interesting because I think that's where the rubber hits the road in the next 10 years, which are which of these, which of your top three bets that you've just outlined are going to be commercially viable uh, and under what conditions will they be commercially viable for customers over the next three years, which I know a lot of the investors, utility, yeah. hydrogen producers on the call will be kind of scratching their heads trying to figure out as our, you know, many of whom are clients trying to figure out is where, 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 where are customers going to be prepared to pay for hydrogen you know, outside of government support. Um, and just before we move on to that, um, I know Ignacio, you had a question earlier. Did you want to pick that one up now or should we we'll move on? Uh, no, we, we can move on and perhaps at the end of the presentation, if, if right. Kate hasn't answered, I, I can ask. Right. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Ignacio. Um, so steel, ammonia, transport, got any any other, maybe, maybe that's the, the, any other message on this slide, Kate? Otherwise, I think it'd be great to move on to the economics. I think I think we're going to see pilots in all of these, um, and we're going to see baby steps in all of these, um, uh, which is which is just why why they're so exciting. Okay, fantastic, great. Uh, so we um, we've been doing a lot of work around the the LCO H numbers, levelized cost of hydrogen, and, and I think. It'd be good just to highlight. We take we take a slightly to perhaps um, more more nuanced approach to this because we 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 tend to focus on on it as a, from a project perspective, uh, and 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 sort of think about them in 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 modules rather than a a um, bundling everything together for for an LCOH. Um, and and the reason that we do this is is because we you know we believe that. The economics of a renewables project and the sort of the commercial structures that you need for renewables projects are very different to the commercial structures that you might need for an electrolyzer project and the type of um, contracts that uh, that you would need with your um, with your end customer. So so we we treat them differently. We we have um, different sort of financial metrics associated with those projects. Um, but but ultimately they they allow us to calculate a, a levelized cost of hydrogen for various jurisdictions for various technologies uh, in terms of renewable technologies battery storage um, and, and and a gate price for our for our levelized cost of of hydrogen. Uh, we, we also um, look at grid how, how grid might play into that and um, I think one thing is probably worth bringing to everyone's attention we, we do as, as, as some of you are aware a lot of um, power modeling and, and, and price curves for, 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 for the industry and for, uh, for, 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 for various sort of the investment community. Uh, and this, um, this quarter, we, we started to model hydrogen, green hydrogen electrolysis projects into those um, because, because you know, they, they, will, they will impact prices going forward. So uh, it's important to, to have a representation, rep representation in those given that we, we're putting curves out there for, for 2050. You know, you, you can't ignore the the evolution of, of, of hydrogen. Um, so so that's quite an interesting development for, for me. So so we, we we work through it from a, from a modular basis, and so that gets us to the point where we have our our view on on levelized cost of, of of hydrogen. So this is the upstream the upstream part, and you know, some of you um, might be disappointed, but you know, based on our analysis, we're we're not expecting 
spectacular reductions in LCH over the next nine years. We are going to see a reduction in the cost of the, uh, the electrolyzers. We're going to see limited reduction in, in, the, um, in, in renewables costs. So, so we will see LCOHs come down. Um, but I, I do challenge uh, in the next 10 years the notion of, of green hydrogen for, for $1.50, personally. Um, Australia are doing some interesting stuff around grid hydrogen, so they they are running electrolyzers at quite uh, low, sort of sixty percent utilization of the grid, and because their their um, their grid is quite spiky and peaky, they they can really bring their LCOH costs down to below two dollars <coughs> um, using using grid power. Um, so so that's an interesting area that that they're exploring. Uh, and, and, and obviously, I've talked about Middle East. That's that's um, clearly an area where we can see some some very low cost renewables and, and low cost hydrogen today. So that just gives you kind of one side of the the story. Um, so so what we also do with our work is we look at the user um, side of, of, of the equation and uh, consider not just carbon prices, which I can talk about here, but what are the, you know, what, what's, what's the incumbent? What are the uh, competing alternative technologies? So when you talk about road transport, heavy duty road transport, you know, what, what, how does, how does hydrogen stack up against um, battery, uh, battery <coughs> how does hydrogen stand up stuck up against biogas you know so so we we look at the other technologies available and 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 we assess in effect what their end um, end users willingness to pay is and and we've done this for the steel in this example and when you look at the sort of commodity prices of some of the higher end steel products that come out of a, of a steel mill and then you apply a a carbon price to to that steel, um, you know, you, you can see what your price point is before green steel becomes competitive with a a, a sort of grey hydrogen steel equivalent. And 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 what what we see for for steel is in some instances, if you've got low cost hydrogen, green hydrogen coming from places like uh, Saudi Arabia and Australia. You can you can have carbon prices as low as 40, um, 40 euros a ton um, to, to make that cost competitive. But as you move into less um, more expensive renewables areas uh, like Europe, then that number starts to to rise up and, and, and you would be looking at something closer to you know, 100 uh, to, um, to to meet the uh, the European criteria. Great, that's really helpful. Okay, I think that's a really critical point there that carbon prices of kind of the hundred dollar, yeah, eighty euro a ton above really do make a material difference to customer economics, particularly in the steel industry. And I think prices today in Europe are about the kind of 42, 43 euro mark uh, a ton. We're not a million miles away from the point at which, you know, the next couple of years, assuming you know carbon prices continue to rise, big assumption there. And we're consuming electrolyzer costs continue to fall again big assumption that we can see commercial reality on projects but then we've got to layer in other things like storage and you know conversion and capital costs to build all that in but i think we've got we're actually quite close in some sec in some of the sectors that you highlighted kate to being commercially viable at the right carbon price which i think is a is a really profound conclusion to reach you know so we don't have to wait for government support or government subsidy um, except in some kind of transitional sense for that to happen before before hydrogen could be realistically uh, a useful decarbonisation option for certain industries. Yeah, and and like my 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 loaf of bread analogy, if you're um, if you're if you're building a car and uh, you use green steel in that car, then the contribution of that steel to the overall cost, or the the additional cost of that steel, is a fraction of the cost of the car. So if you can if you can incentivize um, encourage your your end consumers to buy a green car, then then you know you're, you've you've recovered those costs and 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 it's it doesn't you know it it, it doesn't have a big impact. That's right. 
really helpful. Okay, we ought to move, just move. Yeah, cover your. So again, um, this, this your, is yeah. my. Um, so this is my. I guess my personal personal wish list of, of of some of the key things that we we need to 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 see over the next few years to to support our hydrogen um, ambitions. And I've already talked to one of them was around uh, the the gigafactories. We we have you know electrolysis is not a new technology, but that the scales that we need it is new and not only do we need to, to build uh, electrolysis at that scale but we also need the supply chain and and we've got um, we've got quite a way to go on 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 that i think so so I, we need to see a lot more development in in that space um the second one goes back to the, my very first point which was around electrification and it's really important that when we're using uh, green uh, when developing green hydrogen projects that that renewables component needs to be you know additional to to, to the sector we, we shouldn't be uh, detracting from decarbonizing the grid with hydrogen projects it's not efficient so so we need to look for renewables projects that you know, don't have a home in the grid, and 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 those are the those are the right projects for for hydrogen. And um, the, the other one goes back to scale again. We need, um, you know, if you're building one gigawatt of electrolysis, you you you're you're gonna um, you're gonna struggle to put that all into um, above ground storage. And so we need to further develop our you know, salt caverns. And, and, and create the suitable sort of storage networks for for, for that hydrogen. Um, the next couple of the next one is around um, yeah the gas networks. You know I I, I do think we're going to see um, hydrogen in in the gas network in the future, but there's some some huge logistical challenges around how you transition from the gas today to to hydrogen. In, in the future, so so there's some a uh, lot of lot of planning and and regulations and um, assurances around safety that that need to be worked through, uh, and, and and we need to get consumers engaged on that as well. It's um you know we need we need to make sure that the that the right perceptions um, exist in the in the in the consumer in the consumer base. Um, if we want a, a big trading market for hydrogen, we we need to be able to crack ammonia and uh, we, 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 we don't have technology to do that at a large scale. Now ammonia is, is a great, you know, I think, you know, it, it's the very likely way of, of transporting hydrogen in the future, but we, there's some technology challenges that we need to address. Um, the, the investment barriers, we, we, we talked about carbon prices, but, but there is a, sort of a fundamental, fascinating issue around how we're actually, we're, we're kind of, Renewables and and oil and gas are kind of meeting in the middle, and and, and the two have very different uh, project structures and and um, indexes, and, and and so we need to find a way to make all of that work together um, when to, to to unlock some of I think potential investment, substantial investment that, that is out there wanting to put money into hydrogen projects, and 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 my final point is my loaf of bread and my car. Um, how how do we incentivize, encourage, persuade, cajole um, customers, and, and and not just the privileged few who can afford it, but everybody to 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 buy into low carbon products, um, because that will that will that will make the whole transition a lot easier. Fantastic. Okay, thank you, um, and a great time to take questions uh, or comments indeed from the audience. So, opening out to the audience. Whilst people are thinking, I'll, I'll ask you a question, Kate, because there's mm. one that's been burning in my mind, which is, um, if you were. Uh, you know, if you were a betting person and you were uh, operating a steel factory, uh, you know, would you go hydrogen or CCUS? Where's my, steel Where's my steel factory? Okay. Um, oh, um, you're right. I want to be more precise. Okay, I'm going to give you a. I'm if, going to give if, you if I'm, a steel I'm, factory. No, I will tell you if if it's an existing steel factory, um, 
I, I think I would be looking at blue hydrogen opportunities. A new build, you'd go for green, would you? Uh, I, I would because it's 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 truly blue 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 hydrogen is not zero carbon, so we we mustn't forget that. Yeah. It's it's a, it's a, it's a vast improvement on grey hydrogen, but it's never going to be zero. So you know, so our Rolls Royce is is green. Yeah. Uh, that's our that's our holy grail. And and this is a great project. Uh, um, the EIT Energy, so our, our our friends there who who are supporting a project um, to build a brand new green steel plant in 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 Sweden. So that's exactly what they're trying to do. Okay, thanks. I think we lost you there for a second. Uh, Ignatia, uh, I think you had a question. Yes, Kate. It's more related to to the slide where you were talking about the different worldwide. Uh, policies or strategies different countries has. I wanted to, to understand if you had a, a, a better insight of the South American uh, market, perhaps more specifically about Brazil. And in that regard also, uh, which do you think might be a differential for those markets you were saying possible uh, export, that, 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 that we will possibly export the, the production? Which might be a, a differential for being more competitive from 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 the other uh, countries? Uh, okay, you might just do a Brazilian aggregate first, and then you can yeah, talk about hydrogen. Is that, I think Brazilian aggregate in Asia, we see two main competing technologies on the power side: um, onshore wind, as I'm sure you know, um, versus biofuels, um, and sorry, gas as well, of course. So gas, biofuels, uh, and onshore wind are three competing technologies, which. You know, we think the the levelized cost of electricity for are pretty close. Uh, we think long term onshore wind should win out, uh, but I think biofuels will continue to have a material role in power generation in that market. I don't think you do both gas and uh, and onshore wind. And then the link to hydrogen, I think, is through either biomass or through onshore wind. And okay, I, I think that's that's where you alluded to biomass earlier, right? I think a little bit in thinking, you know, which markets could it play a role in? Yeah. And, and, and the other thing, Ignacio, I would I would also say in terms of sources of competitive advantage and cost clearly, is um, certification. And and you know, I think for 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 product to, to go and getting into the EU market, for example, Sorry. it has to be you know yeah it, it has to have green credentials. Uh, and 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 there could be you know things like additionality. So being able to demonstrate that that project is is um, consistent with these the EU framework will be important. Great. I think okay. we've got a couple of questions. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a question from uh, Aman. Aman, over to you. Yes, thank you, Lash. Thank you, Kate, for your information. Very useful. Uh, my question is, I think the government had put in uh, allocated quite some funding for hydrogen specifically. If I recall correctly, something around uh, 500 million as a fund to you know, jack start up the uh, the hydrogen uh, um, experiment in a lot of cases, some hydrogen town ideas there. Yep. yep. If they were your money, where would you put it in all the ecosystem surrounding hydrogen, uh, whether it's on the supply side or demand side and, and anything in between, whether it's a pipeline transition or uh, ammonia related, where, where would you put it in the in the sort of uh, short term? And and in the longer term, where would you think the large capital investment would would come in, and it would the area the the links on the value chain that would need the largest capital investment? Oh, that's a little... <laughs> so so if, if, where you know what if, if if where would I put my money today? I would um I would look to where um you know where's the greatest subsidy and um. Uh, and one sort of un untapped market today is actually in the, in the UK with the uh, RTFO, the Renewable Transport Fuels Obligation, um, that suppliers have to blend um, alternative you know, renewable fuels into into their in, in, into their fuel supply, and 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 so there are some big subsidies um, in, in from an additional point of view if you, if you can do that. So. Um, I, I think I think that's a, a real opportunity in the UK that, that people are just waking up to. Um, and, and, it, and, your, and your other question was was more longer term, wasn't it? 
Yes, yes. Where the larger capital investment would be needed to sustain the 10 year, uh, let's say the, the paradigm that you laid out. Um, so I, I guess for me, the large is going back to what's the, you know, where can you play which, which requires the lowest sort of carbon costs and, and has got the greatest sort of uh, um, influence on, on, on the end consumer. So I, I would be looking at steel and ammonia. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks, Amon. Uh, and I think we've got another question from someone at Vestas. Apologies, I can't see your name on the on the show up here. Hi, yeah, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, very interesting. I was wondering, you also commented a little bit on the electrolyzer prices coming down, and there are a few players in the market now. Um, do you have any comments on which of these players are kind of leading the price points on electrolyzers and who's going to be in the best position to be sort of Great leading, that, leading that market? I'd love to be able to answer that question. Uh, and we do see the electrolyzer prices, uh, and we have seen electrolyzer prices from Australia to Europe, um, for obviously for, for obvious commercial confidentiality reasons. Uh, we can't answer that, unfortunately, in, a, in an open forum, certainly. Um, what I would say, I think, what we've really seen in the last couple of years is some of the OEMs uh, really adapt their position in the marketplace and invest heavily uh, into the electrolyzer market in different types um, and link that to both, um, you know, link that to other technologies as well. And we definitely see that as a trend. And for anybody that saw our where to invest in 2021, where to invest in energy in 2021, you know, I certainly highlighted that as a big theme around how OEMs are going to develop and adapt their business models and technology portfolio mixes is going to be critical uh, to the evolution of both hydrogen and CCUS and other technologies. So it's a very roundabout way of not answering your question. But, uh, <laughs> but I, just, I think it's, you know, it's, it's in the public domain, which, you know, the, if you look at the, um, you know, the, the gigafactory um, capacity at the, the various electrolyzer companies and, and, and you can, you know, with, with a little bit of pinch of salt, I would say. I've got another question here from uh, Vivek as well. So perhaps, perhaps the biggest green hurdle from Green Energy is rolling out cheap renewable energy fast enough to power electrolyzers. Yep, it's true at a time of demand, expect to rise in the future. Any thoughts? How long do you think it will take for green hydrogen to reach price parity with that producer? Yeah, okay. Do you want to take number two? But number one, I think it's pretty straightforward. I think that's right, Vivek. But you take someone like Australia as an example, there is no shortage of very cheap renewable energy and the ability to sort that out. What they're looking for is a downstream market for the either ammonia or the hydrogen. Um, the, the availability of renewable resource is not the constraint, either really good projects. You know, there are four or five gigawatt type scale projects in solar that we're working on currently in Australia. You know, similarly on wind, Kate referred to the Middle East as well. A really good example of the resource constraint may not be the renewables in certain markets. It will be true in others. India is a great example of that, you know, where actually you want to use the electricity for power rather than for hydrogen. Um, but I don't think there are certain markets which are at the forefront of hydrogen, which may the resource constraint on renewables may not be the issue. In fact, will be the primary driver of hydrogen. Okay, just on a cost, I think, you know, how long do you think it will take for green hydrogen to reach price parity? I think you had a, a good slide on that. And I, I think it doesn't look far away, does it, based on those slides? And your analysis. Price parity with, with grey. Yeah, well, I, I, I think perfect means for grey hydrogen. Yeah. Oh, wow. um, unless he means for power generation, which you could do actually. No, I was talking about, that's right, Elish, I was talking about green hydrogen here. Yeah, yeah, green versus grey, I think, is, is a question, Kate. So I, I think we'll we'll see that this side of um, this side of 2030 for the markets that you were talking about in, in Australia and um, in the Middle East um, and possibly in, in, in places like Chile. Uh, okay. I don't, you know, and but, but they're not they're not centres of demand. Um, they, well, they, 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 they will absorb some of that demand. But but they they need to find a home for for that hydrogen and 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 so you, you've got to layer on all the the transportation and storage costs and and then you're starting to 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 you know, get close to, to to double that that gate price. Thanks thanks Anish thanks Gary. And then we'll take a final question here from one regarding hydrogen production from offshore wind. Do you see better prospects in the short term for a hydrogen produced offshore than shipped ashore or transported via pipelines or b electrolyzer located onshore? That's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a great question, Kate. Do you, do, you, do you produce it, then export, then transport, store it and transport it from offshore? Do you just do it, stick the electrolyzer near your substation? Yeah. yeah. 
I've, well, I mean, you've actually looked. I don't. I don't. <laughs> you're not. You know, the, te- the maturity of the technology isn't there for for developing it offshore. There's lots of challenges in around, it, so you know, saltwater environments um, and and that that need to be addressed. But lots of interesting pilots are in in that space. I, I think it will be a, a is it an optimization problem because it, um, it 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 will be a trade off between the perhaps inefficiencies of. of Citing that electrolyzer offshore and you know on integrated into your turbine yeah. um, versus the the savings from from avoiding some of the in- infrastructure investment that you would have to make. Yeah, spot on. Great. Look, I think we're gonna have to call it a day there. Um, four great themes there: green first, then blue in low cost real markets. Three key segments that Kate highlighted: commercial vi- commercially viable use cases in the next ten years, which we need to analyze, and Kate's wish list of eight things. Uh, which many of which might happen. Um, really fantastic to see so many industry colleagues and clients on this webinar today. Please do get in touch with any of the Bringer team. Uh, Kate and I, if you have any further questions, want to follow up on areas of interest, or like to talk us about hydrogen market and our use case toolkit, uh, 